Metacosis perfectionalis is back. Let's talk about the endocrine pancreas or the hormones secreted by the pancreas or insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. Insulin is secreted by the beta cell, glucagon is from the alpha cell, somatostatin, the doofus from the delta cell. Why do you call it doofus? Because it's a universal inhibitor. This is my biology playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Let's go back to square one. Here is the CEO followed by the general manager and then we have the employees who listen to the manager and the independent contractors who could never care less about that manager. Who is the CEO? Hypothalamus. The manager? Pituitary. The employees that listen, thyroid, adrenal cortex, and the gonads. But the pancreas is not under the influence of the pituitary. These are the glands that are under the influence of the pituitary. Do you see the pancreas here? No. What do you mean by endocrine gland? I mean it's a gland without a duct. It is ductless. And it will release its secretions, hormones, into the bloodstream directly, without a duct. Blood will take me to distant destinations. Not only is the pancreas considered to be an endocrine gland, but it also has exocrine functions, which were discussed in the last video. Today, we'll focus just on the endocrine pancreas. Endocrine pancreas, without a duct, I have beta cells, they are central. They are central anatomically and metaphorically. Anatomically, they are in the center of the islets of Langerhans. Physiologically, they give us the most important insulin hormone. And then alpha cells are around the beta, not as central, not as important, that's glucagon. And somatostatin, the doofus, is interspersed between them. Pause and review. Here is the endocrine pancreas. Beta for insulin, alpha, glucagon, delta, somatostatin. And here's just a visual mnemonic. What's the function of insulin? Of course you know it. It's to lower my glucose in the blood. How come? Because insulin will take the glucose from the bloodstream and put it into cells. When glucose leaves the blood and goes into cells, what's going to happen to the glucose remaining in the blood? It's going to go down. And of course you know this from life. What happened to diabetic patients? Oh, they have too much glucose in their blood. You know why? Because they don't have any insulin or they do have the insulin, but it does not work. How about glucagon? It's the opposite. It raises glucose in the blood and somatostatin is the doofus universal inhibitor, as you know. Glucagon appears in the fasting state. Why? Because when I'm fasting, I'm not eating. No kidding. And when I'm not eating, glucose is gonna drop and drop and drop in my blood until glucagon comes and saves the day by increasing glucose in the blood. All right. Conversely, insulin is abundant in the feeding state. When I've just eaten, glucose is gonna rise in my bloodstream until insulin comes to save the day by lowering the glucose in the blood, by taking that glucose and just rams it into cell. But somatostatin is a universal inhibitor. It inhibits motility. It inhibits secretions of other enzymes and hormones. It even inhibits its own secretion. Okay, metacosis, I'm fasting. My blood sugar is dropping, 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 dropping. This is a stimulus for glucagon release from the alpha cells of the pancreas. Glucagon will stimulate glycogenolysis. Lysis means breakdown, destruction of glycogen. Let's destroy that glycogen. All right, we'll break down the big sugar into small sugar. From glycogen to glucose, hashtag glycogenolysis. And therefore, the result is that glucagon raises sugar in my blood. On the other hand, I just ate feeding state. My sugar is rising, rising, rising in the blood until the beta cell of the pancreas listens and secretes insulin to save the day. Insulin will stimulate glycogen synthesis. Remember when insulin took the glucose by the hand and told that glucose to enter into the cell? Yeah, after I enter into the cell, what's gonna happen to that glucose? We are gonna burn it to make energy or we can store it for a rainy day in the form of glycogen. If you wanna burn it and get energy, this is called glycolysis. If you want to store it for a rainy day, it's called glycogen synthesis. Insulin will boost both processes. I just ate, I just ate. This is the feeding state. Glucose is high in my bloodstream. The beta cell of the pancreas will listen and release insulin. This happens, well, as they say in New York, it's complicated. Let's go. Glucose is in the bloodstream. The pancreatic beta cell has a door. It's known as GLU2. It's a sensor. It senses that glucose because it literally means glucose transporter number two. All right, glucose is going to enter into the cell. All right, if you leave glucose alone, it's going to leave the cell again. It's going to go back 
out of the cell. Well, that's nonsense. How do I fix the glucose inside the cell? By phosphorylation, because phosphorylation fixes stuff inside the cell. When you make the glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, now it is fixed inside the cell, it cannot leave and go back. Now, glucose 6-phosphate is trapped by glycolysis. The long pathway of glycolysis is going to produce ATP, which raises the ATP to ADP ratio because now I have more energy. This energy will close the potassium channels. The normal function of the potassium channel, may she rest in peace, was to let the potassium out of the cell. Hey, potassium, leave, just leave. But now this potassium channel is closed thanks to the ATP. Potassium can no longer leave. Potassium is also trapped in. Potassium is a positive ion. It's a cation. Positive activation. Positive depolarization. Of what? Of the calcium channel. Open the calcium channel. Activate the calcium channel. Ionized calcium is going to rush into the beta cell of the pancreas. Calcium is the here of contraction. Phew! The vesicle containing insulin will contract and rupture. Insulin will be released together with C-peptide. Now insulin is in the bloodstream. What will insulin accomplish in the bloodstream? Many things, including taking that glucose by the hand and say to that glucose, hey glucose, I want you to leave the bloodstream and go into the cell. Okay, and so now I'm in the cell, what should I do? Well, if the cell needs you, she's gonna burn you. This is called glycolysis to produce energy, all right? What if she doesn't need me for the moment? What if she wants to save me for a rainy day? Then she will convert you to a bigger molecule known as glycogen. When I convert you from glucose into glycogen, this is called glycogen synthesis. This is the story behind the insulin world, the feeding state. But glucagon is the fasting state. It's not just glucagon. Glucagon is the main one. But other friends follow glucagon because they are a bunch of second-handers. And they include cortisol, epinephrine, and thyroxine. All of them are here. But the heroic insulin stands alone against everybody. The insulin is independent. Insulin alone is anabolic. It builds up stuff. But glucagon and the rest of the doofuses, cortisol, epinephrine, thyroxine, and etc. are catabolic. They break down. They are destroyers. Why do you want to build up insulin? Because I am in the feeding state. You just ate. It's time to build and save for a rainy day. But hey, glucagon, why do you want to break down? Because you're fasting, doofus. You're not eating. Let me break down glycogen into glucose to supply you with energy. Otherwise, you'll starve. Insulin land, the feeding state, the builder, the anabolic. Anabolic on what? On everything. Protein anabolic, glycogen anabolic, fat anabolic. You just ate, right? Take that glucose, store it in glycogen for a rainy day. If you want to burn it, you can burn it. When you convert glucose into glycogen, this is called glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis. And this is building. This is anabolism. Moreover, you can do the same thing with proteins. Convert amino acids into bigger proteins. Proteogenesis or protein synthesis. Insulin will stimulate the conversion of small free fatty acids into bigger triglycerides in a process known as lipid synthesis or lipogenesis. Genesis creation, lipolipid. In contrast, glucagon and epinephrine and thyroxine and cortisol are destroyers in the fasting state. Let's break down proteins into amino acids. You can take those amino acids and make glucose via gluconeogenesis, but that's a story for another time. Break down that glycogen into glucose in a process known as glycogenolysis. Break those big triglycerides into free fatty acids and some glycerides. When you do this, you will release ketone bodies. And this is called lipolysis. Understand the difference. Glucagon will help the release of ketone bodies. However, insulin is never pro-ketosis. Insulin is the major, if not the only, anti-ketogenic hormone in your body. It does not release ketone bodies, unlike glucagon and the rest of the doofuses. Insulin, feeding state, protein anabolic, glycogen anabolic, and fat anabolic. Therefore, under insulin guidance, protein is being built up and glucose and free fatty acids are being built up. That's why you're not going to find them in the bloodstream because they are in the cell, stored in a big form, not in the blood. Glucagon and the rest of the doofuses belong to the other land, the exact opposite. Remember Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness.
You can do the same thing about a tale of two hormones, insulin versus glucagon. It was the land of anabolism. It was the land of catabolism. It was the age of proteogenesis. It was the age of proteolysis. It was the epoch of lipogenesis. It was the epoch of lipolysis. It was the season of glycogenesis. It was the season of glycogenolysis. It was the spring of anti-ketosis. It was the winter of ketone bodies. What the flip are ketone bodies? There are three. Acetone, acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid. How do I get them? First, you get acetoacetate. Then, this can become beta-hydroxybutyrate or it can become acetone. How do I get acetoacetate? By breaking down big lipids into smaller ones, i.e. through lipolysis. If you find this happening, you can bet the rent money that this is the glucagon world because the insulin world is anti-ketogenic. That's why people with diabetes who have no insulin develop what? Diabetic ketoacidosis. They are suffering from too much ketone bodies. Why? Because they lost their insulin. They lost the anti-ketogenic. And when you lose the anti-ketogenic, you become pro-ketosis. As you know, this is the ligand, this is the receptor. Same story in physiology, biochemistry, etc. The ligand alone is not active. The receptor alone is not active. Only the ligand receptor complex is active. This is normal. Pathology can hit you here, we call this type 1 disease, or it can hit you here, we call this type 2 disease. Example, diabetes mellitus or diabetes insipidus. What is type 1 diabetes mellitus? Uh, we have no insulin. How about type 2 diabetes mellitus? You do have insulin, but the receptor is not listening. It is insulin resistance. It is glucose intolerance. If insulin is anti-ketogenic and I am a diabetic person, type 1, I have no insulin. Therefore, no anti-ketogenic action. I am prone to ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, medicosis, I don't have type 1. I have type 2. You do have some insulin, but the receptor is not listening. Since you do have some insulin, you will not suffer from ketosis. I don't mean 0%. I mean you are less likely to develop ketosis as compared to a person with type 1. And that's why the disease caused by type 2 is not diabetic ketoacidosis, but mostly it is hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome. Pause and review. We are fasting state which is under the guidance of glucagon. Break down the protein, break down the glycogen, break down the triglycerides, which is gonna release ketone bodies. How did glucagon accomplish all of this? Glucagon is water-soluble hormone. It cannot enter the cell. Therefore, you have to put the receptor outside the cell, on the cell surface, and then you meet glucagon outside the cell. Then, who's gonna communicate between the receptor on the inside and the enzyme on the inside? The middleman, the G protein. And glucagon is GS coupled. S stands for stimulation. Stimulation of the adenylate cyclase enzyme to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. So in a nutshell, glucagon is GS coupled. It's gonna boost cyclic AMP and this is how it breaks down everything. If you want to learn more about the G proteins and the hormone signal transduction pathway, I have many videos about these topics and you will find them in my endocrinology playlist here on YouTube. But do you get the basic idea? Do you understand that glucagon causes all of this because it increased cyclic AMP? Yeah, I get it now. When cyclic AMP goes up, it activates protein kinase A. Everything here is A. Here is glucagon acting on its glucagon receptor, which is GS coupled. That's the middleman which communicates between the receptor on the outside and the enzyme on the inside of the cell. All right, activation, boom, boom, boom. ATP gets converted to cyclic AMP. Thank you, adenylate cyclase. Cyclic AMP is going to activate protein kinase A. If you are inactive, I'll make you active. How do you do this? By phosphorylation. Take that inactive enzyme without phosphate and convert it into the active form of that enzyme with phosphate. Some enzymes get active when you phosphorylate them. Other enzymes get active when you dephosphorylate them. When it comes to glucagon, if you know that glucagon stimulates this enzyme, you can bet the rent money that glucagon 
phosphorylates that enzyme. If we say that glucagon is the hero of gluconeogenesis, then you can bet the rent money that glucagon phosphorylates the rate-limiting enzyme step in gluconeogenesis. And you can also be sure that insulin will do the opposite. It will dephosphorylate and inactivate the key rate-limiting enzyme step in gluconeogenesis. This is the essence of insulin land versus glucagon land. Back to biochemistry. Remember ATP? Yeah, and late cyclase can convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And then who takes cyclic AMP to the cleaners? Phosphodiesterase. Absolutely trashes cyclic AMP into useless inactive degradation products. Who stimulates adenylate cyclase? GS coupled receptors. Like glucagon? Yes. How about insulin? It does the opposite. It's anti cyclic AMP. Look at this. Glucagon is GS coupled. I'm going to stimulate adenylate cyclase. Therefore, I'll convert my ATP into cyclic AMP, and glucagon will increase cyclic AMP. That makes sense. But look at insulin. Insulin activates phosphodiesterase, which takes cyclic AMP to the trash. And that's why insulin will decrease the level of your cyclic AMP. Put differently, glucagon phosphorylates adenylate cyclase while insulin dephosphorylates adenylate cyclase enzyme. They are the opposite. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. How does glucagon phosphorylate the target enzyme? By phosphorylating and activating kinases because what's the definition of kinase in biochemistry it's an enzyme that causes kinetic movement motion put in motion how by adding phosphate how about insulin dephosphorylation how by activating a phosphatase what is the definition of phosphatase in biochemistry it's an enzyme that removes phosphate add a phosphate kinase remove a phosphate phosphatase and now there is no bloody wonder why glucagon boosts cyclic amp while well, insulin decreases cyclic AMP. Integration time, let's take it to the next level. Glucagon is GS coupled and it boosts cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A. Yes, I get it. If you remember the sympathetic nervous system, beta receptors were also GS coupled, i.e. also boosting cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. In that sense, glucagon and beta receptors are family. They are similar. They are analogous. But why does that make sense, Medicosis? Why do you consider this such a revelation? I'll tell you. Because suppose that you're running from a tiger. Sympathetic fight flight. Don't you think that you need some catabolism in your life? Yeah. Don't you think that you need your heart to beat faster and stronger? Yeah. Don't you need your bronchi to dilate? Of course. Don't you need some metabolism action? Sure. How about some proteolysis, lipolysis, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis? Oh, I need all of them. Bingo! That's why they are family. That's why they share the same stinking mechanism. Conversely, insulin is the exact opposite. It makes sense. You want more integration? Sure. Glucagon is the antidote for beta blocker toxicity. Wait, 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 wait a second, medicosis. You said that glucagon is similar to beta. Yes, I mean to beta stimulation, to beta agonists. Glucagon and beta agonists are sisters. All right. Therefore, glucagon and beta antagonists are enemies. That's why glucagon is the antidote for beta antagonists. And just to belabor the point because it's worth belaboring, glucagon boosts your cyclic AMP. I know this. Beta agonists also boost your cyclic AMP. I know this. What do you think beta blockers do? Beta blockers do the opposite. Decrease cyclic AMP. Oh, that's why this is the antidote. If I'm taking a drug that's lowering my cyclic AMP, the antidote should be a medication that increases my cyclic AMP. Oh, Genius. Put differently, if I'm taking a medication that's anti-sympathetic, give me a medication that is pro-sympathetic. Now, more review. The feeding state. 
you ate, okay? You are in the feeding state, insulin land. All right, I ate, I digested, I absorbed, it's insulin stand now. Insulin will build up proteins, build up glycogen, build up triglycerides. How? By dephosphorylating the key enzymes. How did the pancreas know that I just ate? It has a sensor known as GLU2. It's the door that lets glucose into the beta cell of the pancreas. Beta cell responds to your eating by secreting insulin to the bloodstream. Insulin will not knock on the door of the cell. Hey cell, take that glucose into the cell. All right, but this will decrease the glucose in the bloodstream. I don't care about glucose in the bloodstream. Take that glucose in. Okay, I will. This is another glute known as GLUT4. As you see here, GLUT2 happened before I released insulin, but GLUT4 is listening to insulin. Ergo, GLUT2 is insulin independent, but GLUT4 is insulin dependent. This is what we discussed today. And here is the apotheosis, the zenith of this lecture. A table comparing between insulin stand and glucagon stand. Everything you need is here. As always, bring a piece of paper, write everything here down, in your own handwriting, in your own words. After you write it down, stare at it, review it tomorrow, and the day after, next week, and next month, and you will thank me later. Real estate agents say the following. Location, location, location. But medicosis says integration, integration, integration. After you understood the physiology and the biochemistry behind insulin, it's time to learn about insulin and oral glucose-lowering agents like metformin. By downloading my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectsnetis.com to learn about the medications related to the endocrine system. I also have a course about kidney physiology, which comes with 10 videos to help you master this topic. Or try my brand new surgery high yields course, which comes with 15 videos, notes, cases, etc. 12 hours of content. For the next two students only, you can get a 70% discount by using promo code FISTULA. If by the time you went to medicosisperfectsnetis.com, FISTULA expired, try Toxidrome for a 40% discount. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snetis, where medicine makes perfect sense.